Today in the morning, John Daniel was explaining that one of the milestones of the OER is to uh, bring uh, resources for developing countries. So we thought that was interesting to connect with the presentation that we are, go we are going to give now, which has to do with a European Commission initiative to support uh, the spreading of the OER in other regions. Uh, so uh, what Daniel and I will present today is a sort of continuation, continuing part of what was presented yesterday, which was a bit of the flavor of, what's the, of the inspiration of this idea of promoting OER or the awareness of OER in, in the Latin American region. Uh, there's a website of the project if you want to have a look, a closer look, and then I'll give the URL at the very end. So this is a project that was just, the kickoff was just uh, 30 days ago. It's going to last uh, 30 months. I'll, I'll present now the partners who are working on it and the phone are coming from Alpha 3, uh, which are, uh, uh, is a European Commission grant uh, focused on developing regions. Um, some of them say, this is a footnote, but some of them say that because Latin America is becoming wealthy with all the training that they, they are doing with China, probably uh, in the coming years they focalize the money in other areas because China is bringing a lot of money to Latin America. But anyway, this is a fantastic initiative and it's, it's good news that there are public funds to foster the openness in, in that region, particularly in the higher education, in the, in the higher education sector. So yesterday I provided much more details about that, just a wrap up summary. Uh, in the region there are something like 700 millions of inhabitants, uh, basically speaking Spanish and Portuguese and Portuñol probably, uh, and something like 10,000 higher education institutions. Uh, now, uh, when, when we go to the topic of the OER, it's is outstandingly surprising uh, how little information uh, there is ex existing about OER in, in that region. So we were uh, exploring some of the uh, different journals to see what has been published um, uh, from the faculties in, in that region about the spreading of the OER and the use of openness not only in the availability of the resources but also in open science. And, and as, I, as we explained yesterday, the main directors of journals over there, they have a very, very little amount of papers. Just to give you an idea, the numbers were like 20 papers published in the whole region in the last, third, uh, in the last three or four years. Uh, so we thought that was uh, outstandingly low, considering that this a population of something like 700 millions of inhabitants. So these are the partners that we have, uh, that we call them uh, fellows from Brazil, Costa Rica, Ecuador, Bolivia, Mexico, Uruguay, Peru and Colombia. But the interesting thing of that is this project is not just focalized in these countries with these partners, but through these people uh, we are working and uh, we, we will provide now the methodology in a stronger network to reach a, a more consistent covering of the whole area and through these people and not through the European ins institutions to avoid as much as possible this neo-digital colonialism. Now, these are the uh, European partners, uh, the University of Oxford, the University of Catalonia that we have here, some representatives, the University of Lisboa and uh, the Italian University Guillermo uh, degli Studi Marconi. Now, the one of the things that I think is interesting of this project is many of the discussion about the OER are primarily focalized in the technical bit and the legal one. In terms of licensing and in terms of which platforms and, and how we are going to connect these metadata, which is definitely an important topic, but sometimes, somehow, the business model and the cooperative models are, they don't have the same, the same level of priority. So we, we are trying to uh, compile this five dimensions plus the pedagogical concept that is something important. Early today was present a sort of counterpart about how is the impact in terms of learning of the availability of these resources that is unfortunately not something that is as present as it should be in these sort of discussions. Now the main goal of, of, this, of this project is a very high level because it's matching some of these very ambitious and worthy uh, phrases of the European Commission in order to strengthen a common higher education area, uh, particularly in the dimensions of economical and social development. Now, 
not only in, oh, in terms of OER, our aim is not spread the construction of repositories all around, but more, uh, more than that, uh, trying to push in this combination of bottom-up and top-down initiatives more in the direction <coughs> of OEP that we think that are as or even more important than the, only the availability of resources. So our, our, our aim is to bring this, this speech this, this talk and this persuasion uh, through 60 organizations in the Latin American region. How are we going to do that? Daniel is going to explain the methodology, but in, in the big picture I can say that uh, this rise, this is increasing of awareness, will be developed through one, a construction of a regional agenda, which we think can be closely linked with the guidelines <coughs> of OER that now the UNESCO is about to sign the construction of institutional roadmaps, which I, th I think is probably one of the most relevant values of this project because it's not, rather than say this is a one size fits all way to develop the OER, this is, these are <coughs> some ideas, some reference, some good practices and these are the things that you may consider or not depending on your resource availability, uh, size, flexibility and so on. And one of the things that we are going to provide uh, is training for these 60 uh, universities through the support of the Open University in Catalonia, which has a lot of experience in, in distance education. And after this training and after the development of this um, roadmap, we will stay during one year in the startup process of each one of these initiatives that push and lead by each one of these 60 partners. Would you like to? My turn. Okay, well, I will talk mostly about this first stage uh, that we are right now starting. Um, the main deliverable which should emerge after this first period is called a compendium. And it composed mostly of two different parts. Uh, the first part is that right now we are trying to recruit the group of fellow institutions, these 60 universities which will, will be working together with the group of, parti uh, of partners. And then, uh, in this first step, we are also trying to understand and gain insight into the current situation, what we call the, state, the OEP state of the art in Latin America. And then also we would like to understand the particular uh, baseline in each of the fellows. So, we, well, this is the general outline. We will be working in this first step uh, during this year, and then next year, um, we will be implementing this uh, the, the um, applied phase of the project. So we have developed a few instruments in order to both recruit the fellows and understand the current situation. And we have asked uh, partners to nominate different institutions that they think that would be uh, interesting potential fellows. So we have asked them, we have eight different partners and we asked them to nominate approximately 10 potential fellows. And then we also uh, released an open um, form, an open online form, in which each uh, university in, in Latin America which is interested in becoming a fellow, they can self-nominate themselves. Uh, I should also mention that universities that have been that have been nominated, they also have to um, complete this self-nomination form and provide us with some information about their institutional context and and also the main motivations uh, that they have for becoming part of the project. And then these two envelopes would be like the recruitment part, the recruitment process, and we have two other envelopes which are aimed at trying to understand this general backdrop, in which, uh, the geographical context in which we are working. And the first one is uh, the OEP state of the art, so we are also engaging partners in the collection of information in each uh, Latin American country about the kind of policies that could somehow help us in the promotion of open educational practices uh, and also we would, we would like 
uh, to know more about other initiatives which are ongoing in these areas. Well, as you can see, we haven't covered the entire continent with our uh, network of partners. So subsequently, we should also involve fellows in the collection of this data. So we have this uh, third form. And then, uh, and after recruiting the final group of fellows, fellows, we will need to understand the specificities of each particular context. So because of that, right now, we are working in the development of uh, a survey. And then we will encourage each of the fellows to run this survey, uh, which is aimed at their um, academic communities. So we would like the extent to which their communities are aware of open educational practices and their willingness to take part in, in this project. Uh, because we assume that, of course, well, it's a very big continent and there is a lot of variation across the different institutions. So this is the, the first the nomination um, form. And each partner, as I already said, should nominate 10 potential fellows. And then this is the self-nomination form. Uh, and it has been distributed online through line survey, an open uh, survey system, in English, Portuguese, and Spanish. And institutions can well, we are expecting um, mostly the decision makers in these universities to uh, fill this form, this uh, online form, so they can choose the language, of course, in which they would like to provide the information. And so far, we have around 45 potential fellows. We would like to reach uh, a final number of 60 universities. So, um, in theory, it will be at the end of uh, April, isn't it, when we are expecting April, May, yeah. But it may be extended. So, apart from this um, online form that, we, that, that I mentioned before, in which we would like to map out the situation and, and collect information about what, what's going on in the region, we will be also uh, conducting a few case studies in order to learn from best practices, uh, both in the region but also worldwide. And we will be also interviewing some experts in order to gain insights because, of course, we would like to understand other projects uh, <coughs> and try to avoid uh, the mistakes that has been already um, committed and, and try to <laughs> learn from best practices. So um, after this project, uh, after this different, these three steps, we will be finally running the baseline survey which I with each institution. Okay. <laughs> and we would like to invite you all to um, give us feedback on, on this, uh, particularly in, on this aspect, because we think that, and we have been talking to some of you uh, yesterday, we think that it would be very beneficial to have common instruments. Uh, it makes no sense if now we are approaching a group of universities with some uh, questions which are completely different to other studies which are being run at the same time. Um, Okay, well, and um, the, the other main strength of this project is that we will be creating regional clusters within the overall network. So each partner will be in charge of somehow tutoring the, a group of universities, not just in their countries, but also in some neighbors. And of course, the opportunity that project will finish, but hopefully we expect that these networks and these hubs will remain, and this is gonna be uh, the legacy of our project. So they should be like s sustainable uh, networks. Now, Chris is Just with, with the last three slides. Uh, as you can see, uh, in addition of the awareness, uh, uh, I guess one of the most important contributions of this project is going to be we are going to be compiling and bringing some organized information and 
quite out date if it's possible and ideally after this meeting linked with other instruments that are applied in other places of the world of what is going on in the region, what are the best practices that could help those decision makers to pursue and to promote that within their institutions and we think that it's highly important to link that with the guidelines that now uh, just in, in the right time are being promoted by the UNESCO. So based on these insights we will shape the regional agenda that as I said has to be one brick of this big wall and we think that could be useful to create the institutions roadmap that will be contextualized and shaped based on the expertise level of interest and in, uh, that we are sure they're going to be diverse I mean in some institutions they might create a department some of them they will create a specific incentive that will be uh, highly customized and in and I think one of the beauties of this project is we have a very little role on it because it's, it's very very based on the proper int uh, interest so with that information and in addition a parallel track the Open uh, University of Catalonia will be designing uh, a training course in order to provide all the insights of what is going on, what are the good practices, what are the best platforms to take, in which countries this thing is working, what are the weaknesses that are important to consider. And this is going to last, this is an tra online training program that is going to last 80 hours and it's going to be certainly for free for all the institutions that will take that. Uh, and in addition we will promote this, the creation of these startups which is in other ways the implementation of this agenda uh, so of the roadmap uh, within each one of the institutions that we have been allocated a decent amount of hours to be close to the institutions in order to help them in the contribution. So uh, certainly there is a high, just to finish, there is a high risk of that uh, uh, as we have been, many of us seen in many European projects or in other places of the world that after the money is gone the projects are fed up and disappear but we are doing our best in order to create a lot uh, to foster the local connections that already exist in order to make this initiative uh, uh, as sustainable as possible so here's a bit more information of the project and the presentation if you want thank you very much thank you Chris have we got any questions for Chris and Daniel Thanks, Chris. Chris, I really like the fact that you were sharing, wanting to share good practice and mm. learning from what doesn't work mm. um, so well. But I wondered if you'd also thought about sharing what doesn't work as part of your journey. That's a great question. I think we have to do that. We have to do that because uh, I'm pretty sure that even if we learn from mi previous mistakes, we will make some of them. So, uh, yeah, I guess one of the commitments that we have is to systematize this experience as much as possible because of the scale, I think it's important. So I would take that as a challenge to do that. Thank you. And also the context and the cultural um, nature of what you're doing. You know? uh -huh. It's a different scale of problem in a way. Isn't absolutely, it? absolutely. It's really interesting to get that feedback. Absolutely. What one of the one of the benefits of this initiative is the amount of countries speaking the same languages, which is definitely a help. But as you say, the context is definitely necessary. First of all, they very beautiful slides. <laughs> 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 Am I right? This is an action research. Project. Absolutely. So when you've done all of this baseline stuff, what are you going to do then? The project ends when the partners are developing their own startup initiative. So I we know, but there's a big jump between that and that. Right, so the instrument that Daniel was presenting are to take a, a current snapshot of before the intervention and a snapshot afterwards. And we are looking forward to see significant difference to present in the Commission. But how's that going to happen? Something has got to be the catalyst. You think, are you going to be the catalyst? Catalyst, what do you mean? Well, the, the core, in uh, theory, the, going to make it happen? The, the course mm. is going to be the main instrument, mm. the capacity building instrument. Mm. The course is going to be the, <coughs> the course. But of course, we don't know yet the kind of OER that each institution is going to be developing because they will have to, to develop their own roadmap. <coughs> and maybe some of them will think that just developing a small, very granular pieces will be their kind of. Uh, open educational resources and maybe some of them will engage in other kind of more ambitious practices but it will depend on their needs and their capacities and 
we will help them with this capacity building uh, training course. Uh, well, developing all this rec previous research. Can I give a little bit of a little <coughs> publicity? Uh, John Daniel in the morning was saying something that I guess we all know, but it's striking to say that uh, the OER community has been very, very close in terms of sharing not enough to other communities. So Joseph and I, we were discussing uh, yesterday how to connect these sort of initiatives in order to make similar questions in order, in order to have results that could be comparable. We are not reinventing the wheel. This is what has been happening the, with the World Internet Project all around during the last 10 years. If we share some questions with similar interests, at the end of the day, we can take pictures from different places of the world and make comparisons. And I think that is a challenge. That, that's why we put here to be designed, because we will be pleased to work in this exercise with others. Yes, um, I've been involved with three different European projects linked to open education source. And one very you know, big challenge is to get commitment. And I, just, I would like to know how are you planning you know, to improve it? Maybe because I'm from Brazil and I know that, that people in higher education are very busy. Mm. How are you, guys, you know, them involved to do the course, seeing work, or uh, you know, um, give data, answer the survey, and uh, share the, the best practice? Mm. Yeah, that's a great question. I would say, that there, within the universities, there are several in universities within that, each one of the institutions. In other words, there are people who are very willing to explore these sort of things, and there are other ones who are very resistant. So I'm pretty sure, and this is it, I mean, in the first few weeks that we opened the call for subscription has been quite significant, the, the answer that we are having now. Uh, there, are, there are certain people who are already familiar with Creative Commons, they are happy to share their contents, and we are taking them as our the leaders within the institutions to promote within, within their own organizations. So they, are, are they involved as a partner? Or are they involved because they are the fellows? Yeah, exactly. Going to get some so we have a money for the talent that they will be working with. I can provide more details now, but uh, Sorry. in a nutshell, is we have eight partners uh, who receive direct funds to promote this within the, the regions, but the other ones, the rest of the numbers to reach the 60, they will receive the training program for free. Uh, and this is what we are offering now, and there we, we are being identifying a certain level of interest on it. And then the selection process is also a way of making sure that they are ready or willing to make the commitment, because we ask them to provide us with information before becoming fellows. So, for example, it's not enough to get nominated by the one of the partners. They have to show us that they are ready and willing to take part, filling this self-nomination form, um, because we know that it's not going to be easy to... <laughs> to keep the level of engagement. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? I think we can take <coughs> one more. I mean, it's, it's not fair to ask you to provide answers for things we all struggle with. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, I suppose my, my only, the, the problem is the training force is only the beginning. It's actually that, that um, hand-holding and capacity building and mentoring and working with that happens after that it's actually mm -hmm. in many ways the harder part. And so I suppose one has to be careful not to put too much investment. Obviously, that there's a lot of investment in the training course, but that is not enough on its own. It's, it's all of that. Absolutely. Aspect. My experience in Latin America is this will be successful if the partners, if the fellows, uh, rely and connect with the local partners. For instance, in Mexico, there's a big university which is leading many of these initiatives, and the rest of them are always surrounding, surrounding that university and in partnership and transferring knowledge and expertise. So if we reach these stakeholders, probably somehow can be succeed. And we know that it's a challenging thing to do. OK? Well, I'd like to ask everyone to join me in thanking the presenters for their uh, visionary presentations. Thank you.